Thank you very much, Hiram. Word with us today, and thank you, Larry and Janice, for that beautiful song. If you'll indulge me just a moment, I'd like to have an added word of prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, I ask one more time that you will blessed today with the words that are spoken. I pray that my thoughts and my words will be your words and your thoughts to us. I pray that your Holy Spirit will override what I have planned to say, if need be, to say what you want said today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, and we'll read briefly a story that Jesus told, a parable, a parable that he told. You can find it in a beautiful commentary on Christ Object Lessons by Ellen White, where she includes many of Jesus' parables in uh, that volume. I don't know if you're aware, but when Ellen White wrote The Desire of Ages, it turned out to be a book of about 12 or 1300 pages. And she and the writers and the publishers obviously agreed that was too much for one book. It was just too big to manage. And so they broke it up into three books, Desire of Ages, 
Christ object lessons, and the thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, which we will be reading this afternoon. And uh, so it's interesting that we have three books from the uh, product of her work writing the life of Jesus. And so the parables are in Christ object lessons, and they are the stories that Jesus told to teach kingdom lessons. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 18, and we'll begin with verse 10. Verse 10, it says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. Now, I've titled my sermon for today, Two Men in Church. Uh, Ellen White entitles her chapter on this, Two Men Go to Worship. Um, Actually, they weren't both worshiping, and that's one reason why I changed the title to Two Men Go to Church. And so it says in verse 10, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. One man, a Pharisee, and the other, a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He prayed to himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican here. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So, we might conclude that the lesson, that the point, that the objective or theme of this parable is humility is better than pride. That would be suitable, that would be fine, but it's much more than that. Much more than that. The longer we gaze into this story the deeper and wider it gets. Let's talk for just a moment about who these men were. Who were the Pharisees and who were the publicans? Pharisees were considered among the most pious and religious of all the believers in God. They wrote the law and they insisted that the law be kept even though they couldn't. On the other hand, the publicans were branded as unfaithful and unjust extortioners. Extortionists. Uh, Today we would see them as the mafia. Because, you know, the mafia will come into town and take control of all the businesses and uh, insist on a tax, a membership fee from the businessmen so that the mafia are profitable and make the management of uh, the businesses, their business, and a profitable business at that. And so a publican was seen as the mafia of their day. You can see why that Jesus' conclusion of this parable literally stunned his audience. The the hearers of this story couldn't believe what they had just heard. That Jesus uplifted the publican 
but put down the Pharisee. Jesus had harsh words for the Pharisees, but he had compliment for the publicans, and so they were stunned. These men represented two groups. I'm sharing a few thoughts this morning from Doug Batchelor. He wrote a commentary on the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And it says, Doug Batchelor says this, These men represent two groups of people. We're not talking about two groups of people in the world, but two groups of people in church. Even two people in our church, two groups of people in our church here at Ojai, very possibly. These two men represent two opposite destinies, the saved and the lost. I see some of you nodding your heads. Those are the ones represented by the Pharisee and the publican. The lost and the saved. Among those who go to church. Every professed believer today falls into one of these two groups. One of these men represents me and one of these men represents you. The question today is, which one represents me? Which one represents you? That's the question. In Christ Object Lessons, Ellen White says this, the Pharisee thinks himself righteous and hopes to win commendation from God, hopes to win praise from God, hopes to win favors from God because of his righteousness. Oh, help us, God, help us. He is full of self-praise. He looks, he looks it, he walks it, he prays it. Self-praise. Drawing apart from the others as if to say, Come not near me, for I am holier than thou. He stands and prays at a distance with himself, wholly self-satisfied. He thinks that God and men regard him with the same complacency. God, I thank thee, he says, that I'm not like other men. Wow. May that not be our attitude. The religion of the Pharisee does not touch the soul. He is not seeking godliness of character. His religion is purely intellectual. It's a religion of the head, not the heart. He is not seeking godliness or God-likeness of character. He is not seeking a heart filled with love and mercy. He is satisfied with a religion that has to do only with the outward life. His righteousness is his own, the fruit of his own works, and judged by a human standard. Now listen to this about the Pharisee that we just read described. And the question is, am I a Pharisee? Are you a Pharisee? Whoever, whoever trusts in himself that he is righteous will despise other people. Wow. As the Pharisee judges himself, by other men, so he judges other men by himself. His righteousness is estimated by theirs. And the worse they are, the more righteous, by contrast, he appears. His self-righteousness leads to accusing other men. He condemns as transgressors 
of God's law. Thus, he is making manifest the very spirit of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Now you may recall that I've been preaching a four-part series about preparing us for evangelism. Do you think we're ripe for evangelism if we're self-righteous? Do you think we're ready for evangelism if we see ourselves as better than other people? Do you think we're ready for evangelism if some people who have worshipped here in the recent past felt judgmentalism and criticism and censure? God help us. God change us. Thus, the Pharisee is making manifest the very spirit of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. With this spirit, it is impossible for him to enter into communion with God. So he really is not in worship. He's in God's house, but he's not worshiping God. It says it's impossible for someone like that to even have communion with God. He, the Pharisee, goes down to his house destitute of the divine blessing. He doesn't even receive the blessing of God. Doug Batchelor shares these thoughts in comparing the Pharisee and the publican. Thoughts that I think will help us in our understanding, but most importantly, help us in our application of this message today. Can we apply it to our hearts and our lives? Here are some common threads between the Pharisee and the publican. These men had a few things in common. First, they both believed in God. But, remember, even the devils believe and tremble. Both the Pharisee and the publican went to church. They were both in church. Sometimes people excuse not going to church by claiming that there are hypocrites in church. Yes, there are. And God help us to receive fully the message and revelation about righteousness and salvation and righteousness by faith. God wants much more from us than hypocrisy. Jesus went to church himself every Sabbath, even though it was filled with hypocrites. Where was Jesus on the Sabbath? In the synagogue with hypocrites. Where would Jesus be today? In church with hypocrites. Some of the hypocrites even wanted to kill Jesus. But that's where he was. He was in church with them. Others complain that church is boring. Uh, but is it the purpose of church to be entertained? Uh, because your pastor doesn't tell a lot of jokes and funny stories and entertain with a little message of three minutes tacked on at the end? Is that a reason to stop going? If your, worship, if your worship isn't fulfilling, here's the solution. Pray for God to change your heart. But go to church. Jesus set the example by teaching and worshiping in church every week. So the Pharisee and the publican had three things in common. They both believed in God, they both went to church, and the third thing they had in common was they both prayed. Imagine that. The Pharisee also prayed. Here are some differences between them. The Pharisees proudly wore their piety. 
They were hyper-conservative. They were a hyper-conservative element of believers who were zealous about the scriptures, the law of God, and the purity of the worship of Jehovah. When the Jews were captive in Babylon, the prophets told them that they were overcome because of their unfaithfulness to God. And so in response, the Israelites in captivity, especially the sect of the Pharisees, formed so that Israel would no longer allow themselves to be influenced by the surrounding pagan nations. That's when the Pharisees were organized. They arose during the Babylonian captivity to see to it that the religion of Israel was preserved and they would never fall into idolatry again. Those are good things. Good things. Fastidious in the details of their religion, the Pharisees knew that if Israel were to fall into idolatry again, God might forever withdraw his perfect protection. And so the Pharisees kept to themselves because their mission was to be undefiled, unspoiled by the sin around them. So they withdrew and kept to themselves. Unfortunately, many and perhaps most of the Pharisees let their zealotry for obedience eclipse their love for fellow men. Jesus called them on the carpet for their preoccupation with external religion and rebuked them for their self-righteous wickedness. In Matthew 23, verse 27, it says this, about the Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, white tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. The Pharisee is a sanctimonious, hypocritical man. Well, let's take a look at the publicans. What can we learn about them? They were tax collectors. Now, we don't hate tax collectors today quite like they did then. And here's why. Here's why. Listen to this. When the Romans conquered the province of Judah, of Judea, they didn't speak the language that the Jews spoke. They didn't know the culture of the Jews, but they needed the tax income. So instead of collecting taxes themselves, they allowed Jews to procure contracts to be tax collectors. The tax collectors were required to amass a certain amount of tax from their district and could keep a percentage of it for themselves. Many of them would exploit their position to extort vast sums to fill their own pockets. Zacchaeus was fabulously wealthy because he was a tax collector in Jericho. But the publicans were hated by the Jews. They were hated by their own people. They were considered traitors for taking God's money from his people and giving it to the pagans. The publicans were also known for keeping the bars open late and for being involved in red light district business. Why? To make more money so that they could pay the taxes or collect more taxes. They represented the worst breed of sinners. The people naturally looked upon the Pharisees as the ones who were the closest to God. They looked upon the publicans as the most hopeless. You know what I saw yesterday? I saw a young man with a low neck t-shirt. It was low so he could show off his tattoos 
And right across his neck in big bold letters was a tattoo. It read, hopeless. I'm not sure what it meant, but if it meant what it, the word usually means, I felt sorry for the young man. I really did. And we're told that the Pharisees looked upon the publicans as the most hopeless people of their generation. They were God-forsaken, they believed. Untouchables, they believed. But Jesus favored the publican over the Pharisee. The question is why? An important distinction between the two men was in the way they prayed. Here's the reason that Jesus preferred the publican over the Pharisee. It was the way they prayed. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He stood up by himself up front. He then thanked God that he was not like the publican. His head was up. His arms were stretched out in show. But the publican's prayer was entirely different. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but beat upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The publican was humbly standing in the back of the church, not even daring to lift his eyes. At this point, the Pharisee began to chronicle all his good works. I fast twice in a week. The Pharisees were required to fast once a week. But this Pharisee, because of his spiritual pride, fasted twice a week. He said, I give tithes of all that I possess. In contrast, Christ began his ministry by saying this, all their works they do for to be seen of men. Wow. Jesus saying that's all the reward they'll ever get is to be seen of men. This parable is important for us even today because we still have Pharisees in church today. Have you been listening? Have you been asking yourself, am I a publican or am I a Pharisee? If the call were made for the publicans to stand and pray a humble prayer here in church, how many would do that? If the call were made, an invitation given, for you to share all the ways God has blessed you this week and how you're enriched with what he's done for you. Do we have any takers that would do that? Probably, maybe, maybe more than that would play the role of the publican. It's interesting that the Pharisee expressed no need of help. No need of God was expressed. His self-righteousness was worthless. Jesus said in Matthew 5, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. It requires humility. Some of us struggle to have humility, but it requires humility to secretly do good here on earth, secretly, and not tell anybody. To give something and not let anybody else know about it takes humility. It helps tame our spirit and reveals our motivation in doing good. Do we act so others will think of us as generous? Do we really care? about the one that we're helping. The idea of the parable is not that standing while praying is bad, but rather to examine why you are standing. Jesus doesn't want us to make a spectacle of ourselves while we pray. Don't draw attention to yourself, either through your actions or by your words. 
Have you ever been in a group, in a group prayer and started preaching for the benefit of those around you instead of really talking from your heart to God? Doug Batchelor recalls a situation like that. He says, I sometimes still do this even with our own children. He confesses. He says, we kneel with them to pray, asking the Lord to help them get good grades. That's our agenda, maybe not theirs. And to help them clean their room, that's our agenda. And we're manipulating prayer to try to get them to do what we want. Do we use prayer to manipulate what we want from God? Amazing. When we deliver little innuendos and messages in our prayers, that's one way we stand instead of being humble on our knees. That's the prayer of the Pharisee. Lord, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. Do you ever question another person's behavior? Hmm. That's easy for us to do. Do we ever question another person's behavior? Are you ever thankful that you're not like that? By the way, if you think you can get off the hook with gossiping, gossip is just an outward manifestation of this holier-than-thou attitude. Often we disguise our gossip as a prayer request. I'm not gossiping, but I just wanted to mention this so we can pray about it together. Wow, have you ever heard that? I have. I may have been a part of that. We excuse ourselves with a false claim. I'm not gossiping, but I just wanted to mention it so we could pray about it together. Then they reveal the gossip. Whom do I trust? Do you trust the Pharisee or do you trust the publican? Or do you trust neither? The Pharisee exalted his own religious practices at the expense of his neighbor. He trusted his own good deeds to make him acceptable to God. He didn't plead the merits of Christ. He didn't ask even for forgiveness. Many good people will do this without realizing it. Without realizing it. You know there's a text in Revelation. Why don't you turn there with me? It's Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. It's the message to the Laodicean church. And we're told that we are the Laodicean church. That we are in Laodicea. Revelation 3 and verse 17. There's something here that I've heard overlooked in most of the sermons I've heard about the Laodicean message. Most of them don't even mention this. They go into the symbols and what the symbols mean and represent, and they skip this. But listen to verse 17 of Revelation 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and, heed of, and have need of nothing. Here it is, three words, and knowest not. Jesus is saying, we know not. We don't know ourselves. And it says, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We don't even know that we're blind. We don't know that we're naked. Wow. We don't know that we're poor. We don't. We must have Jesus show us. And so, um, the Pharisee didn't know his true condition. He didn't know his need, and so he didn't plead for the merits of Christ. The Pharisee, in our parable, was in the same boat. He measured himself with others rather than with God. He lacked a humble, contrite spirit. He felt no need of God and made no request in his prayer. His thanks was not thanking God for being God. 
His thanks was for himself. Five times in his prayer he said, I. It is an entirely self-centered speech. Did you get that? His prayer was not a prayer, it was a speech. Remarkably, the Pharisee made no request at all. Uh, There was a false sense of personal righteousness. The one thing that most distinguished or disqualified the Pharisee from heaven was his self-righteousness. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says about self-righteousness. When a man, this is C.S. Lewis, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. Did you get that? When a man or a woman is getting better, the more clearly they understand the evil that is still left in them. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. So if we want to understand ourselves, we should be asking God to help us understand God and get closer to God. Self-worship. Self-worship. It turns out one was worshiping himself. The Pharisee was confident in his own works of salvation. The publican pleaded for mercy from God. The Pharisee lifted himself up in the sight of men. This gave him a sense of pride and worth, yes, but he didn't find that in God's eyes. He found it in his own eyes. When he wanted to find out what the standard was and where he stood relative to the standard, he looked around him and compared himself with other men. Paul addresses this fatal attitude saying, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We can always find somebody worse off spiritually than we are. The publican was probably not the worst sinner in the immediate area, but he didn't compare himself to men. He didn't pray with a horizontal perspective. Rather, he compared himself to God and he begged for mercy because he saw that the gap was huge. Isaiah, in the presence of God, said, Woe is me. The Pharisee, in the presence of the publican, said, I'm not that bad. We all do this sometimes, whether it's about self-esteem or a skewed defense mechanism. We feel better and perhaps anesthetize our guilt if we can find someone else to criticize. Wow. That's where we hurt each other so often. We recite to the Lord our virtues, our goodness, and list the failures of others, not our own trying to convince God or just ourselves that we're not that bad. But we must stop trying to lift ourselves up like this. It simply doesn't work. Rather, we should compare ourselves to Jesus, lifting him up as our example and standard. Look unto him. That's the only way we can be truly lifted up. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up, James 4.10. It is those who come to God recognizing their spiritual poverty who find acceptance and forgiveness and eternal life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May this scripture be planted deep in our hearts lest we leave our lives unforgiven while the humble leave their lives with eternal life.
I'd like to share this one quotation from uh, one of my favorite old-time evangelists, Charles Finney. Charles Finney, a great evangelist of a century long ago, said this, Remember that every step of progress in the Christian life must be made by faith and not by works. The mistake that many good men make on this point is truly amazing. Indeed, the custom has become almost universal to represent guilt in grace as consisting in the formation of habits of obedience to God. The fact is that every step of progress in the Christian life is taken by a fresh and fuller appropriation of Christ by faith, a fuller baptism of the Holy Spirit. As our weaknesses, infirmities, and besetting sins and necessities are revealed to us by the circumstances of temptation through which we pass, our only efficient help is found in Christ, and we grow only as we step by step more fully appropriate him in one relation or another and more fully clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can be more erroneous, nothing can be more dangerous than the commonly received idea of growing in grace by the formation of holy habits. By acts of faith alone through the Holy Spirit, we appropriate Christ, and we are as truly sanctified by faith as we are justified by faith. Yes, Adventists believe we are both justified by faith and sanctified by faith. And then he concludes, you must pray in faith for the Holy Spirit. You must appropriate and put on Christ through the Holy Spirit. At every forward step in your progress, you must have a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit through faith. Ellen White says, it is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. Are there any sinners here today? It is only as we know ourselves to be sinners that Christ can save us. We must come to God and ask him periodically, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is there in my life that I must surrender Ellen White says this, at every advanced step in Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. It is to those whom their Lord has forgiven, to those whom he acknowledges as his people, that he says, then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. And this quote from Ellen White also, those who are filled with self-esteem and self-love do not feel the need of a loving, living, personal union with Christ. But we do feel the need, don't we? For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. He will dwell with me. He will dwell with you there in our humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. To us as to Moses, God will reveal himself as merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. What a wonderful God we have. Over the last four weeks, we have looked at being a church 
of transformation, being individuals transformed by the power of God. We've looked at confession and repentance, how much we need to confess and repent and to ask God to reveal our need and to wash our sins away. Not only have we looked at being transformed and being repentant, we've also looked at having a thirst for an intimate relationship with God. The only way we will be able to stand in the final crisis of this earth is to have a deep and intimate relationship with God. To know God is the secret. If you want to know how to prepare for the end of time, for the second coming, it's deepening your relationship with God. Yes, there are things we must know. We do need to know the scripture. We must, and I commend to you the word of God but we must also have a deepening relationship with God. And that's one reason why we can't make a a last-minute mad dash to the pearly gates and expect to get in. You can't develop a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus the last minute. On a dime, it must be an ongoing relationship. And now today we looked at two men who went to church. One was a bully. Uh Uh-oh. One desired and sought to have control and to be in control. The other sought humility. It's interesting, there are two ways of comparing humility and pride, the Pharisee and the publican. Here's a new way to illustrate them. The Pharisee was a goalkeeper trying to keep the ball out, trying to keep anybody on the other side from winning. The goalkeeper tries to keep the others from winning. The publican is represented by the coach. The coach tries to get everybody on his team to win. The coach wants everyone to be victorious on his team. And he encourages and praises and builds them up. Oh, may this church, may Ojai Church be a humble church, a church like the coach and not the goalkeeper. May we expect and pray for great things. You know, Barry told us two weeks ago, Barry Pratt told us how he got a phone call. Somebody wanted to study the Bible from Iowa. Well, he started studying. You know what's happened? A a second man joined the study. The first guy invited a friend, and now there are two. In fact, The last time they met, they're studying every night, 6 o'clock every night of the week. Amazing. And the last time, two children joined. Now it's a group of four studying with Barry from Iowa over the phone. I just heard this week that Tess, Tess was invited to meet with a Sunday church on Sundays and explain the Sabbath. What an opportunity. God is opening doors to us. Pray for Tess. Pray that the Holy Spirit will use her and give her the right words. Just this morning, I heard this from Pavel Goya in the ministerial department of the General Conference. He had caught my interest because I grew up in Nairobi, Kenya. He told a story about something that recently happened in Nairobi, Kenya. It's a huge city of 11 million, but very secular. The church is not growing in the city of Nairobi. And so two Adventist pastors said, this has to change. And they started praying. They started praying frequently that God would pour out his spirit in the city of Nairobi. You know what happened? They got a phone call. In the phone call, the man said, is this the Seventh-day Adventist church? They said, yes. They said, "Uh, do you keep the Sabbath? 
They said, yes. They said, I'm a pastor, but I've never known about anybody keeping the Sabbath. Couldn't you study with me? Well, a long story short, they ended up with 200 pastors. It was 190 something, 194, 195 pastors of other denominations that became Adventists and were baptized, and today they are Adventist pastors. More than that, do you know what happened? They brought their church members with them. Tens of thousands have become Adventists in the city of Nairobi, and it started with two pastors praying. How long should you pray? How long should we pray here at Ojai for God to do amazing things in our city through our evangelism. How long should we pray until God acts? That's how long. Until God answers, we should pray. We should pray for revival until it comes. We should pray not for emotions, but for results. That's what we should pray for, that God will bring results. You've heard my past four sermons about preparing for evangelism. I am praying that each one of you will pray and pray intensely from now until the last meeting that God will send his Holy Spirit and do great things among us. Great things. Not only that, but I'm praying that God will so move you and fill you and us and me that even when the last meeting is over, we will continue. Because, you know, the new, newly baptized, the new members, the, 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 the young in the faith are going to need support. They're going to need our love. And so I encourage you, to go back and listen to the four sermons if you've forgotten the details. And pray and prepare yourself for the coming meetings and listen to the verse that Hiram read at the beginning. Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. That's one of Kami Utman's favorite Bible verses. She's lived it. And we can too, right here in Ojai. She has seen God do amazing things that you wouldn't believe if you were told. And that can happen in Ojai. Oh God in heaven, we pray for miracles. We pray for your power, for your Holy Spirit in this valley. We pray, Father, that you will prepare us to be loving and accepting, to be kind and merciful and gentle with everyone, especially the young and the young in faith. Oh, Father, may we not offend anyone. Give us grace. Give us your Holy Spirit presence in our lives and in the words we say and the actions we carry out, that everything will win people to you and uplift your son Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen.
O oh, Father in heaven, thank you for being here and speaking to us today. And Lord, we look forward with faith and anticipation to the great things that you will do in this city and the people that you will bring to us. We also look forward with faith and anticipation for the changes you are making in us and that you are shaping us to be like your son Jesus every day. Thank you for that. And thank you for your promise to go with us and to abide with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Till we meet.